Focus on Abilities is brought to you by Tier Memorial Herman, redefining rehabilitation, removing barriers, re-enabling independence. In the ILRU Southwest ADA Center, promoting compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Welcome to Focus on Abilities, a program about issues affecting the lives of people with disabilities. I'm Lex Fried and I'll be your host for today's program. I'm director of the Independent Living Research Utilization Program at Tier Memorial Hermann, and I'm professor at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. Today we have an interesting program. We'll talk about the ADA, but we'll talk about special education. We'll talk about kids in school who have disabilities. And we'll be right back with that program as soon as we take a short break. Stay tuned to HTV. This is Focus on Abilities on HTV. We're at the Ed White Elementary School. It's an HISD school in West Houston, off Gessner. I'm Lex Frieden, I'm your host for today's program, and our guest today is Dr. Lauren Doonan. Uh, Dr. Doonan, welcome to Focus on Abilities. Thank you. You have a, uh, a unique role at HISD, and I'm gonna ask a question to the audience, one that you and I can discuss. Uh, before the end of the program, we don't have to do it now, but you know, comes as it comes. How many kids in the HISD uh, school system uh, with uh, real severe crises, really how much intervention occurs in the school in a year? And uh, Dr. Doonan, that's a kind of a, uh, a delicate question in some respects. Yes, it is. Before we get to that though, you are uh, the director of I'm the manager of psychological services department for the Houston Independent School District. And that job means what? Okay, our department, the primary function of our department is safety, emotional safety of students. So our primary responsibility is crisis intervention services for students at all ages, all, all grade levels, all campuses. So we provide intervention services when a student expresses that they might want to harm themselves or somebody else when there's been a report of some sort of abuse or when a student is um, has a substance problem or some sort of serious family conflict is that student is experiencing and so the campuses will contact our department and our psychologists will be dispatched to the school to assist that student and their family with whatever the crisis situation is that's occurring at that moment. How many psychologists actually work in your department? We have, there are 11 psychologists in our department, including myself, and we serve all the campuses. So that's about a ratio of one of us for about 35 to 40 campuses. The, uh, the psychologists are called to the schools by the teachers in the schools? Usually by an administrator or a counselor or the nurse. So, for example, what typically happens is a student will um, make some sort of outcry within the classroom. They may write something in their journal that's concerning, or they may be having some sort of severe behavioral or emotional issue that's occurring in the classroom. That teacher would then connect with the front office, usually the counselor, if there is a school counselor, or the nurse, and they'll do an initial assessment. And if it's determined that they need to contact us, for additional consultation or crisis intervention services, then we will go out and work with that school so and the, that campus. So the, the kids have, I guess, counseling on site. Mm -hmm. um, the, the administrator, the counselor, whoever it is that gets the referral from the teacher, mm -hmm. uh, talks to the child. Correct. And makes some kind of assessment there. Correct. Of what the issue is. Exactly. Do these teachers, do these administrators get trained? Do they know how to make that kind of initial assessment? We're ongoing. The training is an ongoing process. We are going to be um, actually next year initiating a, um, a major program through mental health first aid. 
um, of which our department's going to be taking a lead role in training teachers on recognizing early warning signs that a student is experiencing some sort of emotional, mental, behavioral distress, so that we can try to catch these kids early and provide intervention services to them or help their families get connected with community resources to help them provide interventions for those students. So we very much want to prevent crises from occurring. So in a perfect world, uh, the teachers would have some minimal training right. uh, and be able to say, look, this is a, a risky case. There, there's risk involved here. Let's get this child to the office and, and maybe talk to somebody there, an administrator or a school nurse who right. can make another level of assessment mm -hmm. and just confirm that and as soon as that happens then you're you'll get a call and Correct. dispatch somebody to meet with the child. Correct. Possibly the family as well. Correct. We we generally always interact with at least one parent. If a student is referred to us, we want to inter interact with one parent to make sure that that parent understands the nature of their child's distress and we provide them with the resources that they need in order to then pursue assistance for their child. Do you think that some teachers are more tolerant than others and perhaps guide these kids through their crises in, in the normal course of uh, the school year? I think it's possible. Um, I think again, you know, the teachers are very, m most of them are very used to handling, you know, some sort of emotional behavioral issue. If you've got a student who's come from, let's say, Central America, when we had a lot of these kids coming up, and they've been exposed to a lot of trauma, it's going to take some time for these kids to adjust, right? And so we have to account for an adjustment period. There could be language barriers. They've experienced all kinds of you know, trauma, or may, which may be triggered within the school environment by noises or interactions. And so, um, you know, we'll try to, again, assist that teacher. We do consultation as well. So, okay. for example, in that kind of situation, a student may not necessarily be in crisis, but the teacher is aware that they have a new student on campus who may have experienced some sort of horrible traumatic history, and they may want our assistance on how to best address that student and approach that student and educate that student within the classroom. So let's answer the question that I just asked a while ago. Okay. And that is how many, I mean, I want to get a, a sense of how often this occurs in the school. How many kids in a year does your department uh, interact with? How many interventions actually are you engaged in? Last year in our department, we had over 14,000 student contacts. That um, is divided up into both individual contacts and group contacts. And when I talk about group contacts, I'm talking about what we call school-wide crisis situations. So let's say there has been a death on a campus, mm -hmm. either involving a student or a teacher. Um, very difficult situation for the students to cope with. Our crisis team will be dispatched over and we will either go classroom by classroom if we need to do a death notification we will go classroom by classroom, yeah. informing the students of what has happened, and then we set up group counseling services, usually in the school library, where the students will come down, either self-referred or referred by their teacher, hmm. to get some additional counseling. So it's not uncommon for us to see over a thousand kids um, if there's been a serious event yeah, right. that's taken place on a campus. So we've got both our individual interventions and crises and consultations, and then we have our school-wide situations. Yeah, I wondered this how year, that happened. We see that on TV where the kids get correct. counseling, the whole school gets counseling. Correct. This year we've had over 34 school-wide events wow. on our campuses. Let's talk more about crisis intervention. Okay. We'll do so right after we take a break. Okay. Uh, we're here with Dr. Lauren Noonan, from HISD, this is Focus on Abilities. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Thank you for tuning back in. This is Focus on Abilities, HTV's program about people that have disabilities. And uh, our guest today is Dr. Lauren Goonan. I mispronounced your name earlier, I'm That's sorry. That's okay. Uh, Dr. Goonan, the, the kids who are identified that get referred to psychological services. Mm -hmm. Some of them, I think, probably have disabilities in the sense that they've been identified before. Their families have been uh, treating them, sometimes appropriately, perhaps others not. Correct. Uh, and then there are these kids who show up that are not on the radar. Right. 
how do you separate those groups or can you effectively separate the groups immediately? Well, it's, it's difficult. It depends on, again, how the child's referred to us. If we have a situation where um, it's a single episode, let's say something has happened within the family and a child's having a reaction, a depressive or anx anxious episode, that may be a single episode where we should go ahead and refer that child to, you know, and, and let the family decide what they want to do. It is their right. However, if there are chronic issues that are playing out within the classroom, that are interfering with the child's ability to progress academically, interfering with the other children's ability to progress academically, or where there's obvious social emotional issues or beha significant behavioral issues, the school will then, or we will also suggest interventions for that teacher to implement within the classroom. So we have different tiers of interventions at schools. We have tier one, which is considered universal, meaning the whole school is involved in tier one interventions. Tier two are, again, more individualized to students who are showing some sort of difficulty. And if they fail to respond positively to those interventions, then they go on to what's called tier three, which is the referral process for special education. And so, it, so to the extent that you can, you try to ensure that that student stays in the general um, school population correct. as long as possible or as much as possible. Correct. And what's your experience with that? How many of these kids, out of all the kids that you intervene with that are not in the kind of school-wide crisis situation, mm -hmm. do many of them wind up staying in the classroom? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Because we're able to, to if we do a consultation, for example, if one of my staff were to go into a classroom and do an observation of a student, they may observe the student in, a, in one setting and then watch the student in another setting, a less structured setting and then help the teacher come up with interventions that are reasonable for her to be able to implement. And teachers are very busy, right? They've got a lot to do. So we want to come up with interventions that they can actually implement. And then we, we're going to capture data. And we're going to say, OK, you know, maybe this child was having six outbursts a week. And now we've implemented some interventions. And now the child may be down to three outbursts a week. Well, it's not perfect, but that's a 50% reduction, mm -hmm. right? So we're always trying to watch that progress and see if we can get that child, again, to be able to function within the general education setting. So I don't want to oversimplify it, but mm -hmm. are we talking about interventions like moving a child from the back of the classroom to the front of the classroom? Sometimes that could be. What other things? <clears throat> Excuse me. It could be, um, again, where proximity issues. It could be um, behavior charts and plans where the child can earn certain reinforcers for engaging in or not engaging in certain behaviors. Um, it could be developing, if the child is anxious, for example, developing a, a signal that only that child and the teacher would know for that child to say, you know what, I'm getting overwhelmed right now. I need a break. So there's a whole variety of interventions that we can come up with, individualized, that are very reasonable and easy for teachers to implement. What about changing teachers? That sometimes happens because sometimes, you know what, sometimes there is a mismatch between a student's temperament and a teacher's style. And so one intervention that we, we do try, not in the beginning, is to change teachers. For example, if a student might need a teacher who might have a softer approach, or a, a student may need a teacher who's more stru more structured. Well, I've, I've heard parents of kids with disabilities sometimes counsel one another and say, mm -hmm. oh, the solution to that problem is to get rid of that teacher. Yeah. Um, you know, that teacher is just a bad teacher. So the teacher gets blamed mm -hmm. for the kid's behavior mm -hmm. when in fact it may be the kid's responsibility or Correct. it may be that another teacher can be helpful but that doesn't necessarily help resolve the issue that the kid has that they may have later in life. Correct. So are Correct. these the kinds of things you try to analyze? It is the kind of thing we try to analyze. So for example, um, in that situation that you're talking about, we may have a, a conflict between the parent and the teacher, the parent and the school, where um, the parent wants to blame the school or blame the teacher for what the child is doing. Um, that's when an observation from our department can be very, very helpful because we're neutral. We go in there and we give our expert opinion with our own eyes and our own ears about what's happening in that classroom. 
and we may suggest, you know what, if that's an anxious kid and the classroom tends to be very loud, for example, that may not be the best setting for that child and may do better in a, you know, a quieter environment. Um, so we do try to go in there and have an objective look at what's really going on and then we'll go back and we'll have a meeting usually with the parent and the teacher or the parent and an administrator and make some decisions and some recommendations. So a recommendation may not just be, um, as you said, changing a classroom. That's, that is an intervention, um, but it may also be, you know what, this child does have issues that we see not just at school but at home as well. And so we're going to give that, that parent also referrals and mental health, you know, mental health referrals for, for access within their community. Well, that is another issue that you've raised. And sometimes mental health issues do run in a family. I mean, yes, there, there are genetic um, markers that are carried by family members sometimes. Yes. Some families are very well aware of that. Others are not. Correct. Uh, do you ever get calls from parents saying, can you give us an objective opinion about this? Is it just our attitude about the teacher or the teacher's attitude about us? We do. We sometimes get calls directly from the parents to our office. And, um, you know, before we go out to do a non-crisis kind of situation, we have to get consent from the parent. So we must involve the parent in these situations. So if the school says we'd like a consultation, the parent could refuse and say, no, sure. you know, I'm not going to give consent for that. I'm going to handle this on my own, within my own family. And that's their right to do so, as long as that child is safe and not endangering themselves or anybody else. So uh, we do have uh, a, a lot of kids sometimes with behavioral problems uh, that are just a function of uh, their personalities and others that are a little more involved that are yeah. perhaps a function of a, a, a real brain illness or something else. Correct. Um, you're able to sort those kids. That's what we try to do. And to the ones that just have personality issues mm -hmm. that you may not consider to be crisis oriented, you can also provide them with assistance too, learning materials and other things. Mm -hmm. We do, we do a lot of psychoeducation with our, with our schools and with our parents. So like you were talking about just a minute ago with respect to the, the genetic loading factors. Um, that is something that when we're working with a family, we will oftentimes ask about is, is family history, if they're willing to talk to us about that. Because as you know, you know, your risk for depression or any other kind of mental illness goes up if there's a family history. Right. And many, fa many parents don't know that. And they'll say, yes, you know what, I haven't, he has an aunt or he has a cousin or, or my mother or somebody. And so, okay, that's one, one piece of that puzzle, okay. right, that we try to look at. I want to uh, talk some about the challenges that are on the table and what challenges we have moving forward. Okay. Um, we're going to take a break. Stay tuned. This is Focus on Abilities. I'm Lex Frieden, this is Focus on Abilities. We're here with Dr. Lauren Goonan from HISD. She's responsible for the psychologists who work within our school system helping families and helping kids uh, who have mental health issues adapt to the schools. And, and, and I guess you could say that's adaptation, right? Yes. The kids who have uh, mental health issues, we try to keep them in the school, right? Yes, we do. The, uh, uh, the real challenge though are the number of people that we have. Kids, uh, do you have an idea of how many kids you're actually reaching compared to those that you're not reaching? I wish I did. Um, we probably get, our phone calls are probably, again, in the crisis situations where it's, where it's gotten to a level of, where it's a safety concern. But um, oftentimes we will go back to a campus when we have a crisis situation and work with them on educating and say, what were the warning signs before this? Because we would like to get in there earlier. Do you have any other children who are exhibiting these similar kinds of warning signs? What do we need to do in terms of strategies within this school? Oh, that's a great, that's a great intervention right there. Because mm -hmm. you may identify some teachers who are more capable of intervening than others and mm -hmm. some who are more knowledgeable than others. Right. Is that one of the challenges you have getting to all those teachers in the system and making sure that they all meet a minimum standard of knowledge? It is because our district is so large and um, there are so few of us 
to be able to not just you know do our crisis work but also train and do do training and provide um, you know professional development to our teachers to educate them on what's what's the latest on you know interventions for kids with ADHD or what's the latest for kids who may be suffering from some anxiety issues or um, all of those kinds of things and they're just you know our district is so enormous and expansive I think we're 333 square miles wow. Well, one of the issues also has to be budget in the sense that it's a huge school district. Right. The, like any other public program, there's a, a limit in terms of budgets. Everything has to be balanced. I'm sure that you, because of that in part, work with a lot of voluntary agencies and mm -hmm. try to get the kids involved who need that involvement Correct. in community-based services. Correct. One example of that is that um, recently at the University of Texas, uh, Dr. Julie Kaplow has established a grief and trauma center, or trauma and grief center, and um, we are collaborating very much because many of our kids who wind up in crisis have a trauma history, and it was an unresolved trauma history, meaning the child experienced something, has developed negative cycle of coping mechanisms, and is now, for example, in adolescence in crisis. So we talk about crisis here, and we've talked mm -hmm. about crisis intervention. Obviously, some of these kids may experience a crisis which turns you on to them, which gets you connected to them, but right. you also discover uh, that this is maybe an issue underlying these kids are going to have to live with the rest of their lives. Correct. Is it part of your intervention to ensure that they have a program that will help them cope and adapt and, and really... Um, be functional despite whatever impairments they might have through the lifelong process. Absolutely. So, you know, within the education system, again, if it, I talked about the tiers, and again, we do have 504, right, accommodations for right, students. Right. And then again, if a student is not responding to interventions or showing a pervasive pattern across settings, then that student may be appropriate for a referral to special education so that they can get additional modifications and accommodations to assist them in their functioning within the classroom. We want to try to keep them within the classroom and around their normal peers or typical peers as much as possible, but some do need additional assistance outside of the classroom. But, but what we're talking about is that school is more than just uh, learning to read, and learning to write, yes, learning to speak well. It's also learning to manage yourself over the course of your life. Absolutely. And kids who have disabilities, and particularly those with mental impairments, I think benefit from the kinds of interventions that you do and the kinds of lifelong education programs you set forth. Absolutely. You know, those kinds of problems as you're talking about, not just academic, because we do have students who are incredibly bright and so may not have difficulties with their grades, but they are still really suffering, right? right? And um, then learning how to manage themselves and advocate for themselves and um, understand what it is that they're going through so that as they progress in life and go into adulthood, they can take further responsibility for themselves, you know, going to college and seeking out services on the college campus, for example. You mentioned 504. That's a section of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Um, we're going to close the program, but I'll share my personal story. After I broke my neck in a car accident in 1967, I applied to go to a university in the South and was told that I could not go there because I used a wheelchair for mobility. Um, it, that was in 1968. Five years later, the federal law said that schools could not discriminate on the basis of disability and that right. started a whole uh, process throughout America where schools, of uh, uh, educational uh, institutions of all sorts began to accommodate people with disabilities mm -hmm. and I think through the years we've evolved our programs we have an individualized approach that's dictated by section 504. Right. Uh, that along with the ADA has made a sea change and you probably observed a mm -hmm. lot of that. I think a lot of those people um, before these um, kinds of laws have taken place would, would have, you know, if those laws were not in place, we'd probably see our dropout rate would be much higher. Those kids wouldn't be coming to school. Um, and if there was a physical impairment, you know, many times there's a secondary emotional component to that. That's a good point. So um, um, those laws are incredibly important to maintaining kids within the general education setting and within society. Lauren, thank you. Uh, Dr. Lauren 
Goonan has been our guest today on Focus on Abilities. I thank you all for watching. I think it's been an interesting program. I hope you'll tune in again next time for more Focus on Abilities. Focus on Abilities was brought to you by Tier Memorial Herman. Redefining rehabilitation, removing barriers, re-enabling independence. And the ILRU Southwest ADA Center, promoting compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act.